complex numbers. We'll begin with an illustration. If I wanted to find the zeros of the function f of x is equal to x squared plus 1, I would set the function equal to 0. Subtract 1 from each side and then take the square root. So I would get that x is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative 1. The square root of negative 1 isn't a real number, and so mathematicians created a whole expanded system of numbers using what they call the imaginary unit, i. And i is defined as the square root of negative 1. The entire system of numbers, just so we can keep straight our Venn diagrams, if I had a Venn diagram of the complex numbers, so complex numbers are in the form a plus bi, and a is the real unit, and bi is the imaginary unit, and together they create a complex number. So complex numbers can be considered all of the numbers that we deal with. Within the complex numbers, we have the real numbers, which remember within the real numbers, we had rational numbers and within the rational numbers, we had the um, integers and then within that we had the natural numbers. But we can also within the complex numbers, have just imaginary numbers. So the imaginary numbers is when just the, there the a value is zero, so it's just the bi, and the real numbers are when the b is zero, so it's just the a, but then the rest of the complex numbers are all in the form a plus bi, where a and b are not zero. So let's make sure we understand how to simplify with um, imaginary numbers. If I had something like the square root of negative 16, I could simply split that into two factors, negative 1 and 16. The square root of negative 1 is i, the square root of 16 is plus or minus 4, and so my answer is plus or minus 4i. So we can actually perform operations with complex numbers. On this slide, we're going to focus on sum or difference of complex numbers, but we can also multiply and we can also sort of divide, but divide gets a little bit tricky. But we're gonna focus on addition subtraction right now. And for that, we're simply going to add the real parts and the imaginary parts separately. So for instance, and you can show as much or as little work as possible. On this first question, I'm going to show a lot of work just so you can see exactly what I'm doing. If I wanted to, I could rewrite this without the parentheses. And this is how your textbook shows it. Now this is minus, so if I was going to write this without parentheses, it would be minus four and then minus negative three i, so plus three i. Again, and then your textbook shows rearranging to 3 minus 4, and then plus 2i plus 3i. The idea here is that, of course, we're going to take the real parts and combine the real parts with real and imaginary with imaginary and come up with a new complex number. So 3 minus 4 would be negative 1, and then 2i plus 3i would be 5i. Now, i would not show that much work. i would just show that work here. So I'm going to look at 1 and 3, and it's plus, so 1 plus 3 is 4. And then I have plus 2i, and I have minus 2i, so I have plus 0i, but 0i would still be 0, so my final answer is 4. That's how much work I would show, is really none at all. I trust you that you're able to do that math mentally. Let's look at our last question. Again, the real part comes first, so I'm going to ignore this 3i at first. I am going to, for the sake of not messing up my negatives, I'm going to change this to plus, change this sign, and change this sign, and change this to plus, and change this sign, and change this sign. And now I'm going to add the real parts together. So I have positive 2, and I have negative 2, and so I have 0 for the real part. And then I have plus 3i, and I have minus 3i, 
and then I have minus 5i. So my answer is negative 5i. Now, if I wanted to, I could write that as 0 minus 5i, but obviously it doesn't make sense to write the 0 in the same way that I didn't write plus 0i for the second question. When we're finding the product of complex numbers, the main thing to keep in mind is that you will end up generally with an i squared value and you're going to turn i squared into negative one. So whatever that term is, is going to actually be added to the real part of your solution. So let's take a look at this first question together. If I have two binomials, I'm going to FOIL. Remember, Mr. FOIL says take the first times the first, so that's 3 times 4 is 12. And then outside, so 3 times 3 minus 3i is minus 9i. The inside is plus 2i times 4, so that's plus 8i. And then the last, so FOIL. And that gives me 2i and minus 3i, so that's minus 6i squared. And of course, that makes Mr. Foil, and that's how we know that we're done. So again, F-O-I-L, first, outside, inside, last. From here, the negative 6i squared, so I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this. I'm going to combine negative 9i and positive 8i to get minus 1i squared, I'm sorry, minus 1i. And then this term is negative 6, but then i squared is negative 1. So really what I have is positive 6. So I'm adding 6, which means my final solution is 12 plus 6, or 18, and then minus i. Let's do another practice. When I'm doing the second practice, notice I have three terms that are being multiplied. You can choose when to apply the 4. So if I wanted to apply the 4 right away, I could write this as 4 plus 8i, and then times 3 minus 2i. Make sure that you don't multiply 4 by everything. That would be very incorrect. You would be multiplying by 16 instead. So now that I have two binomials, I'm just going to FOIL again. 4 times 3 is 12. 4 times minus 2i is minus 8i, plus 8i times 3 is plus 24i, and plus 8i times minus 2i is minus 16i squared. Now minus 16i squared is going to turn into plus 16, because again I'm multiplying negative 16 by negative 1. So now when I'm writing my final solution, I have 12 and plus 16, so that's 28. Then I have minus 8 and plus 24, so that's plus 16i. I said near the beginning of this video that we can sort of divide with complex numbers, but instead of division, we're going to multiply by the complex conjugate of the denominator. And a complex conjugate sounds complicated, but really, if you have a number in the form a plus bi, the complex conjugate has a form a minus bi. So a minus bi has a complex conjugate of a plus bi. So all we're doing is we're changing the operation between a and b. So let's take a look at our first example. 4 minus 2i is my denominator. I'm going to multiply by the conjugate, which is 4 plus 2i. So we're just changing the sign. And again, then I'm just going to FOIL. So I'm going to FOIL in the numerator, and I'm going to FOIL in the denom denominator. So in the numerator, we're going to get 8 plus 4i plus 12i plus 6i squared. And in my denominator, I'm going to get 16 plus 8i minus 8i minus 4i squared. Now, the reason that we use the complex conjugate is for this reason right here. In the same way that I don't want a radical in the denominator, I don't want an imaginary number in the denominator. And by multiplying by the complex conjugate, we're going to get rid of that i term or that imaginary term. So I'm now just going to combine like terms. Plus 6i squared turns into minus 6. Minus 4i squared turns into plus 4. 
And so I've got in the numerator, 8 minus 6, which is 2, and then plus 16i. In the denominator, I have 16, and then plus 4, which is 20. And I can see that every single term is even, so I'm actually going to go one step further and divide everything by 2. So my final solution is 1 plus 8i divided by 10. Now let's do the same for our second question. Again, we're multiplying both the top and bottom by the same thing. And the reason that we can do that is this is just a form of 1. If I divided this, I would get 1. And it's OK to multiply or divide by 1 because we're not changing the solution. We're just changing the form of the solution. So what is the complex conjugate of 1 minus i? It is 1 plus i. So I'm going to multiply by 1 plus i in the numerator and denominator again, and then I'm just going to FOIL. So first is 5, outside is plus 5i, inside is minus 1i, and last is minus i squared. In the denominator, I have first is 1, outside is plus i, inside is minus i, last is minus i squared. Now, just as we did before, plus i minus i cancels, and then I have, instead of minus i squared, it's minus negative 1 or plus 1. And instead of minus i squared, it's minus negative 1 or plus 1. So now I'm just going to simplify. 5 plus 1 is 6. And plus 5i and minus i is plus 4i. And in my denominator, I have 1 plus 1, which is 2. Just like last time, I see that everything is even, so I'm just going to divide everything by 2. So I have 3 plus 2i divided by 1, which I don't need to write the 1. Let's take a look now at two quadratic functions that are going to have complex solutions. And we're just going to use the quadratic formula for each of these. To begin, keep in mind that a is the coefficient in front of x squared, b is the coefficient in front of x and c is the constant term so using the quadratic formula x equals the opposite of b so the opposite of negative 5 is 5 plus or minus the square root of b squared so negative 5 squared is 25 minus 4 times 1 times 10 is 40 all divided by 2a which is 2 times 1. Now, if you feel the need to show the step before this, which would show negative 5 squared and minus 4 times 1 times 10 inside the radicand and times 2 times 1 on the bottom, you can certainly do that. I just like to keep it um, as short as possible. So now I'm going to simplify. I've got a negative 15 inside the radicand. And so I'm going to think about that as the square root of negative 1 and the square root of 15. Now, even though 15 breaks into 3 and 5, that doesn't help me because neither of those um, are repeated factors, so it's not a perfect square. So we're going to keep this, the 15 inside the radical, but I now have 5 plus or minus, and then this negative square root of negative 1 is i. So square root of 15, and keep in mind that the i is not inside the radical. So Sometimes we put the i in front of the 15, sometimes we put it after. That's all divided by 2. If I want to write this in the proper form, remember a complex solution is in the form a plus bi. So that's why quite often you'll see people um, separate it out into two terms. So the first term would be 5 halves. I'm going to write that twice. And then I'm going to add radical 15 over 2 i and i'm going to subtract radical 15 over 2 i so again just looking at each each of those parts separately if we were to look at the graph of that quadratic we can see that the um, legs of that parabola are not going to cross the x-axis meaning that we don't have any real zeros now looking at the second question we're going to follow the same steps a is negative 1 b is 4 c is negative 5. 
if you get uncomfortable about a negative leading coefficient, you can certainly multiply everything by negative one and you would get the same solutions. Your graph would look different. So if I graphed it as is, it's going to look uh, like my second graph on the screen. If I graphed after I just changed the negatives to positives and vice versa, it would simply flip over that x-axis, but you would still have no real solutions. So we're going to stick with the original and we get x equals the opposite of four, so negative four plus or minus the square root of b squared, that's four squared, minus four times negative one times negative five. So negative one times negative five is five times four is 20 divided by 2a, so 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. That gives me negative 4 plus or minus the square root of negative 4 divided by negative 2. Again, negative 4 is the square root of negative 1 and the square root of 4. The square root of negative 1 is i. The square root of 4 is a perfect square, so it's 2. So I have x equals negative 4 plus or minus 2i divided by negative 2. Again, writing this as two separate factors. I've got negative four divided by negative two, so that's positive two. I'm going to have that twice. And then I've got positive two i divided by negative two, which would be two i divided by negative two or minus i. And then I've got negative two i divided by negative two, so negative divided by negative makes it plus i. Up next, we're going to take a look at lesson 2.6 over rational functions. Again, that is Larson Precalculus 11th edition.